So thank you all for joining us. Uh, I just made the announcement again uh, uh, that this meeting is uh, being uh, broadcast in English and in Spanish. Uh, thank you again. Uh, my name is Tito Corona, Metro Community Relations Manager, uh, and you are here joining us for the East Side Transit Corridor Phase Two uh, Extension Project to uh, Whittier. Uh, tonight we'll be focused on East LA. Um, all those words basically say we're extending the gold line uh, from East LA onward. So again, thank you all for joining us. If this is your first time, welcome. Uh, if you've been joining us uh, previously, thanks for, for continuing uh, to follow along. Uh, last time we were here was in November, where we provided a brief update after being out away for, for some time. And uh, so now we are moving forward with additional information we would like to share with you uh, this evening. I wanted to let you know that uh, this meeting is being recorded. Webcams are off uh, if you are joining us and you don't see yourself, that's okay. Uh, the presentation is, is, what, uh, is what we'll be sharing with you. Uh, later on this evening, you will be able to unmute yourselves when we open up the Q&A, but during this whole time, microphones will remain off during the formal presentation. Uh, once we get to the Q&A, then you'll be able to raise your hand using the raise hand feature. Again, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you will see a button that says raise hand. Uh, select that and it'll show uh, it'll show in queue that your hand is raised just like mine is right now. Um, and once you start talking, we will lower your hand so the next person can get in line. And again, you will have a minute and a half to uh, make your comments. Uh, so please uh, uh, take notes as we go through the presentation. And uh, additionally, if you have questions at the beginning, most likely your question will be answered through the presentation. Uh, so just so you know that, you'll also be able to type in your questions using the Q&A function when we get there. If you are joining us uh, via telephone, please, uh, phone callers, use star nine to raise your hand. That'll be the way for us to see that you have a question and we will call you by uh, the digits on your phone number. So uh, so just be, in a, be listening out for this, uh, the, I think it's the last three digits of your phone number. Again, thank you for joining us. Uh, we have a lot of information to, to provide since we last met with you in November. Uh, so we let's go on to the next slide. Um, wanted to provide a brief icebreaker. Uh, this is an opportunity for you to uh, participate in a poll where we're going to ask you, how did you hear about this community meeting? It's, uh, it's always great to see how you joined us, and we're always looking for uh, better ways to uh, communicate with you and to get more folks to, to participate. So if we can bring up the, uh, the poll uh, so we can share with people, that'd be great. Okay, so I'm going to pause for, for a few seconds while we start taking these polls. Seeing a lot of folks that are joining uh, that receive notification through email, that, which is great. Thank you for joining us. And hopefully you are also able to forward these emails as you receive them to help increase our reach. Uh, also, we saw some people getting mail notices. There's a lot of additional uh, methods, uh, friends, family, coworkers, community organizations. We appreciate everybody participating in this. And it, it's great that this is a community effort in reaching out and letting people know about these meetings. So we'll give this a few more seconds. Uh, we, you know, as I see that uh, we have uh, quite a bit of people so far, it looks like about half of the people have participated in this poll, but uh, it's look, uh, it looks like we have quite a bit of folks here. Thank you. Okay, it looks like uh, we're done with the poll here. So I appreciate you uh, you joining us again. It looks like email was the, uh, the number one method of communication or of, or of you uh, hearing about this. Thank you again for joining us. And we appreciate you uh, being here tonight. Uh, let's go over the agenda. Um, uh, we'll discuss the uh, purpose of today's meeting. And uh, after that, we'll, we'll discuss the proposed project overview and updates. I uh, let you know what's what's the latest on the project. Then we're going to have uh, folks from real estate, uh, Craig Justice, and come in and talk about the property acquisition process. And this is just something to to understand what the process is uh, moving forward. We do these for all the projects, so people get a better understanding of what the relocation process is is about and how that works. Uh, should uh, should there be any impacts uh, to real estate uh, through this process? Then uh, we'll come back and talk about the community relations portion of the construction and mitigations program. Talk about the teams that are really coming to your community uh, to inform you and keep you up to speed on what's going on 
once we move into construction. Again, we're bringing all this information up, but uh, we'll sh you'll, you'll see the timeline pretty much where we stand with this. And uh, you know, there's, there, there's gonna be quite a, a bit of opportunities for you to, to hear more and to learn about this process. Then we'll come back and talk about the pro proposed project design overview, show specific areas and uh, how this works in East LA. And then we'll come back and have a Q&A session. I did want to let people know again that we do have Spanish speaking folks uh, both here uh, virtually and also in person. I did want to acknowledge our folks uh, over in East LA at the Atlantic Park. Uh, thank you for joining us there in person. Uh, we have staff that uh, is bilingual Spanish, uh, such as Edna Jimenez, Edgar, Jimenez, Edgar Gutierrez, um, Yvette Jimenez, no relation to Edna. Uh, we have Jenny Cristales Vallos, who is our project manager, who you'll be hearing from soon again, bilingual. Uh, we have Lillian De Los Gutierrez, some of you, many of you may know, uh, who is on this project as well from Metro. Uh, I myself uh, am bilingual. Then we also have Melissa De, De La Peña, who will be doing the uh, proposed project design overview. She is available in, uh, to speak in Spanish as well, should we have any questions, uh, in addition to Jaime Guzman. and also uh, from folks from real estate, uh, uh, we have Constantine, we have Lisette, and we have Alfredo who are uh, Spanish speaking as well. So we have quite a bit of folks who can ask your questions in Spanish. So if you are listening to us in the interpretation and you have you are Spanish speaking, prefer to ask your question in Spanish, please, when we get to Q&A, raise your hand and ask your question in Spanish. We will be able to answer your question and interpret it. So we appreciate you for joining us. Let's go on to uh, uh, our expectations before we move forward. We are uh, conducting a respectful meeting uh, and we, uh, th we're doing this to allow folks ideas and comments to be shared in an open and fair environment. You may not agree with some of your neighbors are saying, or you may agree greatly with what they're saying, and that's great. But again, please respect that we all have our own opinion and we value everyone's opinion and we want people to feel uh, a safe space to be able to share what their thoughts are. So please direct your comments towards us as we move forward and uh, try to have a respectful dialogue with everybody about this project because there's a lot of information to share with you and we do want to make sure that you are able to to understand what we're talking about here and have a friendly dialogue with us we're here to we're here to work with you and to and to have a great discussion so with that let's go on to the next next slide where i'll introduce the project manager here uh jenny cristales avios who will uh discuss the purpose of today's meeting Hi, good evening. Um, again, my name is Jenny Cristales Ceballos, the project manager um, leading this effort. Um, just wanted to remind folks, and I know Tito already mentioned this, but um, for now, everybody's going to remain on mute until we go through the presentation. And again, we have quite a bit of information to share tonight. Um, so please be patient until we open up the lines when we start our Q&A. Um, so um, just hold on to those questions towards the end of the presentation. Um, so today, the purpose of the meeting is really we want to keep the communities informed on the latest updates. We recently went to the Metro Board and we updated them on project information, and now we'd like to share that with you. Um, we also want to gather input um, in terms of what our community and stakeholders think about the proposed project design at this point. Um, and then we'll also talk a bit more about, you know, the next steps in the environmental process so that the communities can stay engaged. Next slide. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the two meetings that we recently had with our East LA businesses and also the, our property owners. Um, so in January, the East LA Chamber of Commerce, the East LA Coalition, and also the Whittier um, Boulevard Merchants Association hosted a meeting uh, where us, the project team, had an opportunity to present. And then we also met with um, businesses and um, commercial property owners uh, last week uh, to also present basically the same information we're presenting tonight. Um, just wanted to also um, acknowledge that we heard concerns uh, related to you know, quality of life in East LA. And so wanna share those with folks so that um, we let you know that we heard you in terms of what are the issues that are, are currently the, or the challenges that we see right now in East LA. Um, so we have those identified here in terms of, you know, the parking challenges and also, um, you know, what would be disruption and displacement for some of the businesses in the area, uh, street closures. But, you know, we, we heard a whole host of, of uh, challenges that we hope that as Metro as an agency, along with the various agencies, 
uh, such as LA County uh, planning, public works, um, you know, the safety that we all collaborate to try to find ways to find solutions to these, these quality of life issues. So just know that we're in coordination with all the agencies along with the communities as well. Next slide. Um, as part of our equity platform, you know, the agency is looking to meet equitable goals. Um, in part, what Eastside as a project has done, has partnered with community-based organizations. And so right now we're working with eight organizations for them to help us reach out to the community. Um, so what they've done is that they come to the table and we meet with them to understand what are the best ways to outreach to the community. Um, so we look at ways um, to basically either have them do extended outreach as well, um, how they can help us uh, basically format the presentation so that it's in a digestible manner for the communities. Um, so we meet with them right before we go out to the communities to see how we can best present the information and how we can best outreach to the communities. Next slide. So now I'm going to provide a quick project overview. Um, just want to share a little bit of the history. I know some of you um, have been uh, diligently involved and been coming to our meetings, but there are some folks that may be new um, and want to walk through the project history. Um, so we, you know, every project begins with an alternative analysis to understand routes um, and what types of modes, meaning can we do light rail, bus, bus rapid transit. So we look at all the different alternatives that we can connect from, you know, now where Atlantic Pomona is to uh, the terminus. And so we did that in 2009. And from 2009, there were two alternatives that were studied, similar to how we're studying the Washington alternative today. We, were, we studied two light rail alternatives at that time in 2014, which included the SR-60 and the Washington alternative because we received uh, uh, quite a bit of comments from the community and also some of our partner agencies, such as Caltrans, EPA, and also the Army Corps of Engineers, we went ahead and studied the alternatives a bit more to understand what are the ways that we can connect, for example, the Washington alternative to Washington Boulevard, right? So from Atlantic, Pomona, how do we get to Washington? So we studied that in 2017 and in 2019, we now reinitiated this environmental process to look at three different alternatives, which was the SR-60, the Washington alternative, and then to build both, the combined alternative. But after studying the, the project a bit more, um, we realized that the SR-60 had a lot of constraints related to engineering and environmental. Uh, in addition to that, it really didn't quite align with some of our policies that were recently um, adopted by the board. So with that, we withdrew the SR-60 and the combined alternative. And now we're focusing the study on the Washington alternative. Next slide. So this is our current project timeline. And you'll see the slide one more time because we want to talk a little bit about that timeline and what are the key elements of that. So right now, we're in the environmental stage. So we're studying the project to understand the impacts for construction and operations. And so we're looking to have final environmental clearance by 2023. Um, and then do final design in between, leading up to construction in 2029 and operations by 2035. Um, this project is a priority project for the board. Um, and basically it's one of the four pillar projects that again, we're looking to see or find ways to accelerate this project uh, to open it sooner if the funding and um, the technical work all fall in place and that we get direction from our Metro board. Next slide. So this is the Washington alternative, which is what we're currently studying in the, in the environmental document. Again, it's a proposed project. Um, so it's approximately about nine miles to the city of Whittier at the terminus on um, Lambert Road. Uh, this includes seven stations, one of them being um, the relocated Atlantic Pomona station, in which we shared with the community back in November, um, two options for the Atlantic and Pomona station. Uh, Melissa will probably dive in a bit deeper once she, once she 
uh, begins her presentation on the proposed design project. Um, and so here we have an underground station at Atlantic and Whittier, and then also an underground covered station at Commerce and Citadel. And then we go into an aerial configuration and I'll show what an aerial configuration means on the next slide, meaning that it goes above ground. Um, and then also we have a design option in the city of Montebello, which is either at grade or aerial, meaning street running or above um, at Greenwood. And we're looking at that station as well, either at grade or aerial. From there, the um, alignment proceeds at street level running um, to the city of Whittier. Uh, next slide. And as mentioned, these are the different types of con configurations. So as Melissa walks you through the design, she's gonna present the design after we've gone through a couple of slides that we'd like to present to you. Um, she's gonna speak about aerial. And so aerial, as you can see there is, is above ground, not running at street level. And then we have at grade, which is at the street level. And then we have underground. And there you have a picture of the station uh, portal, which is um, at Mariachi Plaza. And then we also have underground um, Memorial Park here as an exhibit, because we talk about underground, but it's an open station. Um, so just keep these in mind. We'll have this handy throughout the presentation or th during Q&A, should you have questions about the various LRT configurations. Next slide. So this project has uh, funding allocated through the Measure M Expenditure Plan. Um, and essentially from in cycle one is for the Washington alternative, which is in the amount of $3 billion expected in 2029, which is when um, groundbreaking and construction is likely to begin. Um, so due to the $3 billion that we currently have in Measure M, we'll move on to the next slide. Next slide. Since we have $3 billion in the Measure M expenditure plan, and also understanding that typically Metro projects are implemented in a phased approach, we updated the Metro board last month on what would be initial operating segments. And basically the initial operating segments is that phased approach. We have constructed in phases. And so the first IOS or initial operating segment that we're studying is uh, to commerce. And that's approximately 3.2 miles. It includes three of the uh, underground stations, which is Atlantic Pomona, Atlantic, Whittier, and Commerce. And this will slightly extend a little further east uh, to uh, link up to the maintenance storage facility site. Each of the IOSs needs to include a maintenance storage facility site so that uh, we can store and service uh, the line. The second IOS is to, uh, to Greenwood, and that's approximately 4.6 miles. Again, that will have that will include the three underground stations and will run um, either aerial or at grade in the city of Montebello and with the Greenwood station either aerial or at grade. Since this is a little further east, um, this could be potentially served by the Commerce Maintenance Storage Facility site or the Montebello Maintenance Storage Facility site. And these maintenance storage facility sites. Um, are, are, would potentially uh, be able to store anywhere from 100 to 120 light rail vehicles. Um, so again, that, that provides um, a lot of um, space so that when the regional connector in downtown opens, these maintenance storage facility sites would be able to accommodate that, that need. Uh, next slide. So with the phased approach, again, we have our IOSs and then we also have the full project. Um, so these are preliminary costs that were developed based on 15% design. We still have close to 85% design to go. So as the design progresses, uh, these numbers could change. Um, in addition to that, the reason why you see ranges on, on the screen or on the presentation is because we're still looking at certain design options and depending on the design option, 
um, you know, that that's what the, the proposed cost will reflect. Uh, additionally, this doesn't include the Atlantic uh, Pomona Open Underground Station. So there's still a lot of work that we need to do to really understand the project costs. But for now, this is what we currently have uh, based on that 15%. So 6.1 to 6.5 billion uh, for the full alignment. And then iOS Commerce and iOS Greenwood is between 4.5 billion and 5.3 billion. And again, these include the maintenance storage facility sites as well. And so understanding that there is 3 billion um, allocated through the Measure M expenditure plan, um, Metro staff, also our consultant teams are looking for ways to fund the rest of the project to see if there are any opportunities at the federal level um, to see if we can compete for some funding nationally. And if so, we would have to um, activate the federal process for environmental clearance um, uh, in order to accept those funds. So hopefully we'll be able to find funding for either the project um, or certain project elements. Next slide. So I'm gonna turn it over very quickly to Jaime Guzman, uh, who is our environmental consultant. He's gonna talk a little bit about the draft environmental impact report um, and, and the updates to that so that folks have a good understanding in terms of what to look out for uh, in that, uh, for that document. Thank you, Jenny. Um, as Jenny mentioned, we are, um, uh, we, because of the board decision made in 2020, we are now focusing only on the uh, state environmental clearance, which is the California Environmental Quality Act or CEQA. And CEQA uh, was done in the previous uh, document in 2014. So we are taking that evaluation, uh, updating it for all the required environmental topics under CEQA, which are approximately 20 of them. And these include uh, all different kinds of topics like traffic, noise, air quality, um, you know, community-based uh, impacts, biological resources, and cultural. What we look at in the document as we are um, looking at potential impacts is to look at the short-term uh, potential impacts, which are construction and short term is more of that it's not a permanent impact. Uh, some of the short term could be uh, for uh, a, a good period of time, but they are considered short term and that they're not permanent. And then the long term or, or permanent operational uh, impacts. We also look at cumulative impacts as this is a very developed uh, corridor and there's still some uh, growth happening. We want to make sure that we take into consideration the impact of our project with everything else that's being developed. So in the environmental document, you will see those uh, three types of analysis. And we are doing that for all of the alternatives at the same level. Um, so we're looking at the overall impact from uh, all the way from East LA to Whittier, and then also looking at, we'll be looking at the um, uh, uh, shorter uh, initial operating segment uh, impacts. Um, Part of a very important part of, of what we do for environmental clearance is to have um, good public outreach and have a lot of community input. And so we're having a meeting uh, now to kind of give you a little bit more information on the project that's designed itself, but we will con continue to have some meetings and we anticipate to have some meetings prior to the release of the draft environmental impact report, which is scheduled right now for um, spring, summer 2022. So it's coming soon. And uh, what we plan to do is provide information that we are assessing in there, including information that uh, will result from some of the things that are presented to you uh, later today or later in this meeting. And, um, and so what we anticipate is that you will be able to look at that uh, document, uh, read the different kinds of impacts and then provide further input as we uh, progress through the environmental process. As we you know, continue to talk a little, to talk about the project, and then also um, want to want folks to get familiar with these project elements um, as Melissa will talk about them in the the, the the design, the project, the proposed project design. Um, so these are some of the project elements that basically we would need um, some level of property in order to do construction. And so early on when we did outreach in East LA, um, it was 
conveyed to us or mentioned to us that the extraction of the tunnel boring machine would be preferred in the northern part from East LA um, and launching from Commerce. So extracting this giant drill, essentially the tunnel boring machine uh, would require roughly about two acres. And again, this, this is a giant drill machine that drills very slowly that as it's mentioned here, it would be unlikely that people at the surface would even see it, hear it, or even uh, feel its operations digging underground. And so we would look at, you know, somewhere along Atlantic, which Melissa will share in terms of the area needed uh, to extract the, uh, the TBM machine, the tunnel boring machine. Next slide. Another project element is that we would also require roughly about three acres for, temp for temporary construction staging. And as you can see here, there's a picture there of Little Tokyo, um, which is still being used as a construction staging area where um, we store equipment, materials, and there's construction vehicle parking, as well as uh, temporary offices for some of the construction crew and staff. Next slide. Another type of construction that we do, and it's limited specifically uh, to certain areas and um, in particular to build our stations, right? So it's called cut and cover. And essentially what we do is we dig um, uh, an opening through the surface at a, at a, at a depth um, and construction starts to happen for the station. However, they, um, uh, the construction teams will put decking so that traffic can continue to flow. So in order to create cut and cover, uh, there's, um, we try to minimize the amount of road closures for that period, short period to excavate and then put the decking. Um, after construction is complete for building stations, then it's backfilled and then the streets restored uh, to its uh, normal conditions. Next slide. Okay, we're back on the project timeline um, because I'd like to emphasize that there are certain activities that begin once either the environmental document is approved by the board. Basically the board approves the project at that point when the environmental, doc the final environmental document is complete. And um, from there, if funding is available, we then start to look at pre-construction activities. And our Metro real estate team is gonna talk about that a bit more because that's when they get involved. They get involved, as you can see here, uh, we won't start possibly construction until 2029 per our measure M timeline. Um, and that's when we anticipate the funding. Uh, but I'm gonna turn it over to Craig. He'll be able to talk a little bit more um, uh, provide an overview in terms of property acquisitions because once Melissa goes into the design, you'll start to see which are which are some of the affected properties along the corridor. All right. Good evening. As Jenny said, my name is Craig Justice and I'm with Metro Real Estate. Um, Metro is a public agency and is a public agency implementing a public project there's certain requirements that we need to follow. So for this project, we follow what's called the Uniform Relocation Act or URA for short. As the slide says, the intent of the URA is to create uniform, fair and equitable treatment of businesses or, or persons that are affected by this project. Now let's go to the next slide, please. So I'm gonna just do a very high level review of the general acquisition relocation process. So for acquisition, there's three key steps. Um, we appraise, we acquire, and we relocate. First step with appraisal is we're gonna, the appraiser will reach out to the property owner. The appraiser would really, they wanna walk the property, understand how the impacts are, meet with the owners, get as much information from the folks that own these properties. So they can take their appraisal, determine what the impacts are and what the value and get a resulting what's called the fair market value. So 
Those right-of-way requirements, Jenny had indicated, we may need something for staging, a temporary construction easement. We want to know what the value is of those right-of-way requirements. Once we have the fair market value, we'll move to the next step, which is acquisition. Someone from Metro Real Estate will meet with each of the owners, present a formal offer for the value of those right-of-way requirements, and then we enter into the negotiation process. Um, once a, an agreement is reached, then we go ahead and we open escrow. Metro staff handles all the transaction documents. They're there to assist the owners through the escrow process. Concurrent with acquisition is also relocation, which is step three. So for those owners, tenants, occupants that are impacted by the project, there's a relocation provision and it provides certain benefits to those folks that are impacted. It's very complicated, but in, in sort of high level speak, it provides advisory service and compensation for those that have to move. We'll go to the next slide, please. So this shows an overall duration of the acquisition and process. So on, on the bottom of the slide, and I know I can't point to it, it, it shows 18 to 24 months. Um, it's important to note that that 18 to 24 month period doesn't begin until we have environmental approval and the project team is certified what those property requirements are. So we need to have something final saying, uh, Metro Real Estate, these are the requirements. We need a temporary construction easement or something else. Once we have that, then we go into those steps that we talked about in the previous slide, appraising, offer negotiations, working through escrow, and then eventually closing it. But again, the 18 to 24 months start once we have an environmental approval and certified property requirements. Let's go to the next slide, please. Relocation process down at the bottom, we, we show it's about a six to 18 month process. That six to 18 months begins once an offer is made to the owner. So once an, an offer goes out to the property owner, then someone from relocation from Metro's team will reach out to those that are impacted. They'll conduct initial interview. They'll provide formal relocation notices. They'll start providing advisory services helping coordinate any kind of moving, processing payments, and then ultimately working with the occupant to find that replacement and, and vacate that property that is impacted. Um, so that is just a very, very high level overview of how that process works. Uh, Metro Real Estate staff will be on during this call and I know, or this meeting, and if there are questions, we're happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Um, and so uh, just like Craig gave a very high level overview of the real estate uh, right away acquisition relocation uh, um, portion, uh, I'm also gonna provide a, pre a brief uh, overview on the construction relations and mitigations program. Uh, when, uh, when a project goes into construction, uh, especially a project of this caliber with Metro, uh, Metro comes in with a, with a team of community relations folks uh, with an office on site uh, within the alignment where the uh, project will be. And there will be opportunities to go into the office to get more information, to speak to somebody one-on-one, -on -one, uh, to get information um, for yourself about the project or also to discuss any, any potential impacts if you have a business along the alignment. Uh, Metro works to create signage uh, to maintain business um, use while we're in construction. Access is always uh, provided to the businesses. Uh, we, uh, the Metro Community Relations staff will work with all the businesses that are along the alignment uh, with maintaining the access for them and uh, also working with all the um, 
uh, neighborhoods and stakeholders that are along the alignment uh, for you. So there's quite a bit that goes on when uh, when we go into construction. You see a team here that's working on this project. Uh, you're going to have your own personal team that will that you will call the East Side Phase Two Extension Team that will be on site that you can go to the offices just to get more information uh, once we go into construction. As you saw in the timeline, uh, that's that's a few years away, but we're there and uh, there will be a, a team there to work with you to help you. Uh, additionally, for businesses, if we go on to the uh, next slide, there is something called the Metro Business Solution Center. And that is also to help the businesses along the alignment that are impacted by the construction to help provide resources uh, with businesses to help uh, maintain uh, their business during the construction and also beyond. Uh, this is an opportunity for businesses to, to expand uh, if, the, if they need more help going online, creating a website, uh, things like that, other resources that we have. It's a great opportunity to, to uh, work with Metro and also to work with the businesses on behalf of Metro to get your business out there uh, in another method other than you know the in-person. But again, we're there to help you with all the uh, resources that are available. And then this will be available also at these walk-in offices that we will have uh, once we go into construction. Um, it's called the Business Solutions Center. It, again, it provides hands-on business development, uh, small business advice and coaching, expert assistance, a lot of information referrals, long-term business planning, and um, it, it's just going to keep growing uh, as far as how the resources work. We also have what's called the Eat Shop Play. If we go into the next slide, um, that's another opportunity. It's free advertisement that Metro does, uh, and it promotes businesses that are also impacted from the construction uh, that's going on in the area. A lot of businesses that we work with on Eat Shop Play, uh, they also provide uh, discounts to help increase uh, uh, traffic to their businesses uh, through the Eat Shop Play. So if somebody comes in and shows them their, their tap card, they'll you know they realize that it's a it's part of the Eat Shop Play referral and uh, provide whatever discount they, they agree with Metro. Uh, it's an opportunity to also get uh, businesses or, I'm sorry, get assistance and uh, foot traffic to your business uh, through other means uh, from folks who uh, take transit uh, to people who are walking, biking, or rolling in the area. As that, you know, it's all part of how we, uh, we design these projects uh, with, a, with you in mind. So, um, and overall, that's, that's pretty much how we do this, uh, this effort of creating a, a team that's going to be at your, at your, in your area to help and work with you as we move forward uh, with construction. Again, we're still in the environmental phase. So we still have to go through the draft environmental impact report, then come back and finalize the environmental impact report and then get project approval. And then we go into design and then we go into construction. So I'm talking about what's going to happen in construction, but we still have all these other steps that we have to worry about and, and complete. So just letting you know, we have plenty of time to get this team ready and, and have everything available, but we did want to give you at least an overview of what types of uh, work um, is available. The next slide is something that, again, uh, will be, have to be approved by the Metro Board. It's called the Metro Business Interruption Fund. Again, this is something that has to be discussed uh, with Metro and approved by Metro, and it provides financial assistance to small mom and pops uh, with 25 or fewer full-time employees. It's, uh, it's been implemented in certain areas along the alignment. Of, sorry, I saw along Metro system from the Crenshaw project to the Purple Line Extension Regional Connector. And these are, this is another um, option that is available. Again, this is, this is something that has to be approved. It, uh, so uh, as we move forward in the process, uh, hopefully this is something that can be provided. Uh, going on to the next slide, I want to talk about the project labor agreement. So some of you may, may, may be thinking, well, you know what, construction projects coming to my area, I would love to, you know, to myself uh, learn about construction, be a part of this process, be, you know, help build the project as well as, as gain a trade, or ha have family members I think would be gr great in participating in this. Um, this is where the project labor agreement comes into play. Uh, in uh, January 2012, Metro approved this, and it's basically uh, a set of standards that the contractor who's building this has to abide by. So they have the 40 20 10 rule 40 percent of the targeted workers are people who are from whose primary residence is from an extremely or economically disadvantaged area it's a way to get uh folks uh working with this project and uh, being a part of it uh to to help build it and also gain a trade uh if they're uh you know uh from an extremely economically disadvantaged area 
Additionally, there's a twenty percent apprenticeship program, where an individual is enrolled in an apprenticeship program, which is that's where you learn how to do construction. And uh, we work with local CBOs to help recruit for folks that would like to get into uh, construction, and uh, they go through a program and they work along with the contractor uh, moving into this uh, this new field that they're looking at. And then there's a 10% disadvantaged worker uh, portion that is also required on the contractor. And it's targeted workers who face additional barriers uh, from people who are recent veterans or veterans in general, uh, homeless folks, because uh, single custodial folks, uh, you know, you have foster care people with uh, who are just uh, who have a criminal justice system hi uh, history, but are looking to rehabilitate. Again, this is an opportunity for them to get into this trade. And again, we we uh, this is part of the uh, the uh, project labor agreement where Metro has the contractor uh, recruit folks that uh, fit under these categories. So those are the opportunities that are that come with construction once we go into construction. So if you're interested in, in joining us and being a part of the construction and helping build this project, this is an opportunity that will come along once uh, we get closer to construction. Now with that, I wanna introduce Mr. Edgar Gutierrez who will uh, provide an update on the new interactive online tool that will be part of this uh, project to get you more information on this project moving forward. Edgar. All right, good afternoon or evening, everyone. I'm joining you from the remote viewing location at Atlantic Park, and uh, we're, we're excited to provide an announcement on a tool that we're working on uh, releasing very soon. It'll provide additional content and more of an interactive, engaging tool for you to explore the corridor. Everything from interactive maps, embedded multimedia, and all the project resources will be linked onto here. This is part of the growing trend and recognition that people access information in different ways and in more interactive ways with touch screens on your cell phone, on the go, 24 seven, when you wanna access the information. So this essentially is just providing broader access to those details that are not currently available on the project website. And the timing is great because a lot of details will become available as part of the release of the draft environmental document. So at that point, we would be also updating the tool with additional components. So we just wanted to make this announcement in advance of the release so you can have something to look forward to. And uh, we look forward to uh, walking through that tool once it becomes available. Thank you, Tito. And I'll turn it back to you for the Q&A process. Melissa, while you're, uh, while you're sharing, let me provide, uh, let me, uh... Uh, acknowledge a few folks who have joined us tonight uh, from our elected uh, staff. Uh, from the office of Hilda Solis, I wanted to acknowledge that we have Martin Reyes in the audience, Antonio Chapa, uh, Guadalupe Camberos, uh, Anali Paniagua, and from the uh, office of uh, Congressman Jimmy Gomez, we have Yvette Aragon. Thank you all for joining us. Again, if we uh, missed you, I will, uh, I will acknowledge you at the next part of the Q&A. But uh, again, thank you for, for being here and representing your offices. All right, uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Melissa de la Pena from Cordova. As mentioned, I'm gonna go through um, the East LA segment of the project, starting uh, from the top. It's about a mile and a half. Um, you'll see, I'll, I'll split the corridor into four different sections that we'll walk through on the slides. And uh, each section will have an orientation slide like the one you're looking at now that kind of gets your bearings and then we'll share the design, uh, the design exhibits that show a little more detail on what's being proposed. So starting here at the top, um, this is Third Street from Civic Center to Woods. So um, Civic Center is right here, if you can see my cursor. And this is the part of the gold line that basically exists today leading toward the terminus. So this is where our project uh, picks up. So um, the next slides will show um, the design features for this section. So as Jenny mentioned last uh, time we came around for meetings, we were very focused around the stations themselves, uh, especially Atlantic and Pomona, the open and closed concepts. So this shows a side-by-side -side comparison of where the project picks up. So here's the East LA Civic Center station. We are at grade along Third Street until this little boxed area here where we start going underground. And by the time we reach woods here on the right, and this is for both conditions, we're fully underground. And just something to note for all future slides, we're underground for the remainder of 
East LA section of the project. Um, the only difference between the station options is that the open underground station starts to turn toward the south a little bit earlier than the closed underground. So I'm going to move, uh, cover these uh, further south. So this is back to the orientation slide. So we flipped this. So north is actually to the left on this, on this slide. So we're picking up here on the southerly edge and then taking a turn down Atlantic. And you see the difference in the two alignments is between the two station options with the orange one being the closed underground station and the yellow being the open underground station. So we'll do a side-by-side -side comparison of these on the next. So this shows a little more design detail as we approach the stations. Um, the closed underground station turns onto basically the center of Atlantic Boulevard. And keep in mind, just a reminder, this is all underground and um, continues along the median uh, along Atlantic. The lower alignment is for the open station, which is where my cursor is now. And then it turns just to the east of Atlantic and then meets up with, with the alignment just north of Eagle Street. Um, I'll split these into two separate ones so that you can see a little closer. This, the blue shaded areas are those um, potential options for staging that Jenny was mentioning earlier. So these would be required for, um, for staging the project and, and construction. So for example, here's the McDonald's on the corner of Atlantic and Pomona, just to orient you. And this is moving south. Um, in this case, um, at 4th Street, the property closest to 4th would be um, where the extraction of the TBM would take place. Um, and beyond that, then we would be in Board Tunnel. This slide shows same area. The open underground station here is in this triangle property and is accessed um, from the streets. And this is a, a shallower station than the fully underground, but yet you still need to go down to access the platform. And then the alignment follows down Atlantic, but just to the east of the street. So construction won't be taking place along the center of Atlantic in this condition. Um, and then until we get to Fourth Street, and in this case, it's this easterly property where the extraction would take place. Um, next piece we're going down the corridor is from, from Eagle Street to Hubbard along Atlantic. Um, here is Atlantic Avenue Park. And um, it's pretty straight shot as we go down Atlantic here and we're in a board tunnel all the way down. So again, fully underground. So this will pretty much look the way it does um, after construction is complete and actually during construction too. The final piece uh, of the alignment through East LA is shown here from Whittier Boulevard uh, up on the Northern side down to Goodrich. And um, here we do have another station, which is Atlantic Whittier, where my cursor is. Um, last time we came around, we mentioned uh, it was at the Skechers site as opposed to the CVS, which was a historic property. Um, what you'll see here is similar to the Mariachi Plaza uh, portal entrance that Jenny shared on the sample slide previously. Um, so this will be where you go underground to access the platform. And again, in the blue shading are the properties that are options for um, construction area sites. And keep in mind that multiple options are shown here. Not all of the properties shown would be required, but they, um, they give you an idea where that could take place. Um, and then further from here, as mentioned, this will all be um, board tunnel construction and it'll be you know launched in commerce and then coming up 
toward the extraction site near 4th Street. And uh, thanks for hanging in there. I know we shared a lot of information. Um, this is my last slide, so I will pass it back to Tito. Thank you, Melissa. And as we are transitioning again to our slide uh, for q and A, I uh, looks like we did have another person joining us uh, that has been on from the, uh, I'm trying to uh, find my appropriate correspondence, um, from the Office of Assembly Member Carrillo. Um, I want to admit, acknowledge uh, Maricela Villar. Thank you for joining us. Uh, again, um, I, we have staff from the offices of Hilda Solis, uh, Congressperson Jimmy Gomez, and Assembly Member uh, Wendy Carrillo. Thank you all for joining us and being a part of this. Uh, so with that, uh, now let's start our Q&A. Uh, so we're going to ask people to raise their hands using the raise hand function. If you are calling, I do see that we have quite a few telephone numbers that are um, on the line. If you have a question and you would like to ask it uh, through the telephone, uh, please hit star nine on your phone and it will uh, trigger uh, raise hand next to your phone so we know that you also have a question. Um, again, um, star nine to raise your hand. And when it's your turn to speak and unmute yourself, uh, we'll let you know, we'll, we'll say your last three digits of your phone number, and you can unmute yourself using the feature star six to unmute your microphone. So star nine to raise your hand, star six to unmute yourself. Again, you will have a minute 30. Uh, if you have more questions, again, uh, we'll ask you to please let people um, ask their questions, uh, and then we'll come back to you after we go through the first round of folks. And if you want to come back, you can do so again, just like uh, where, where we do in person, where we stand in line. And then once we're done, we have another question, we get back in, in the back of the line and we come again. So we'll do that and, uh, and uh, just take your questions again. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, we do have quite a bit of questions and hands that are up. So with that, let's, uh, let's get started. And uh, we'll call the first person uh, who has their hand raised. Uh, looks like we have Sylvia Corona. If you can uh, unmute yourself and ask your questions. You, uh, you have a minute 30. Uh, please ask your questions and then we'll, we will answer them for you. Thank you for joining us tonight. Sylvia, if you can unmute your mic, please. Mute. Okay, please. Um, ¿Me escuchan? Bueno. Sí. sí, sí, la escuchamos. Ok, hola, hola, señor Tito. Um, quería yo, estuve escuchando toda su presentación y ustedes nos pintan todo muy bonito. Yo soy una persona que vivo aquí en el centro del este de Los Ángeles. Uh, cuando pusieron el metro, nos cerraron todas las calles de la tercera, los accesos. Uh, le hicieron promet promesas a los negociantes. Uh, nos prometieron a todo mundo el sol y las estrellas y todo eso fue un fracaso, un verdadero fracaso, porque ahorita la calle primera está muerto de negocios. Quitaron la transportación. Además, nos trajeron bastantes homeless del centro de Los Ángeles. Aquí está lleno de gente. Ahora, otra de las cosas. En caso de un temblor, ¿qué es lo que pasaría? Uh, otra de las cosas, yo digo, también ustedes este, ya planearon todo y entonces, ¿por qué hasta el último nos están avisando ya cómo está todo listo? A mí no se me hace eso justo. Y yo pienso que todos nuestros representantes deben de poner mucha atención a lo que está pasando. Porque esto es algo bien serio y que nos afecta tanto. Ahora a las personas que les van a quitar sus propiedades, que supuestamente se las van a pagar, ¿a dónde se van a ir a vivir? Si ahorita no hay lugar, lugares para vivir, ¿cuánto cuesta una renta? ¿Cuánto cuesta una propiedad? ¿Ustedes piensan que la gente va a agarrar una propiedad al precio que la agarraron en esos tiempos? Sabemos que ustedes van a dar a poner este um, el real estate y evaluar. Pero eso son cosas muy entrañables. Nuestras propiedades, nuestros hijos, donde nos hemos criado y todo eso. A mí, yo creo que deben de buscar una manera. Estoy completamente en contra de, de que quiten alguna propiedad a las familias. Porque somos familias que hemos vivido por muchos años aquí. Uh, eso del metro de aquí de, de Indiana y Lorena. Nunca han puesto algo para que la gente 
no pase alguna, un señalero o algo que pare ahí, que mejore. Sí nos están prometiendo muchas cosas. Bueno, pero... sí, um, gracias Silvia por su comentario y um, vamos a, a, a trasladarlo a inglés para que todos oigan y escuchan todos sus, sus comentarios y uh, podemos responder a sus preguntas, así para que usted pueda aprender dónde es que estamos en el proceso. So can somebody please translate? Uh, Jenny, uh, so uh, in the English channel, it was translated oh, uh, okay. to English. The, although there may be some folks who don't have a, a channel selected and like us who have it in the off feature. So we only hear English non -tran not translated. So um, I, I think um, mm -hmm. what I'm going to ask is for people who are joining right now that are that want to hear this in English, please uh, switch over to the English interpretation. So on the uh, bottom of your screen, the interpretation feature, that's, uh, uh, please select that and hit English. So if we have questions in Spanish, you will begin to hear them translated into English. But because um, some of us may not have been doing that, if, uh, we can have Yvette come and have a, uh, provide a very brief uh, uh, paraphrase of, the, of what was discussed and we will answer uh, your question, Silvia, in English. Uh, okay. Silvia, si okay. está escuchando en, con la interpretación en español, favor de... Eh, sí, estoy escuchando. Sí, aquí okay. estoy. Vamos a traducirla, uh, vamos a, a, a darle la respuesta en inglés. Um, si puede escoger o, o regresar a la interpretación, al, al canal de interpretación que está en español para oír su respuesta. Está bien. Gracias. Thank you, Tito. And thank you... Um... Um, okay, so I'm just going to translate the comment from Sylvia. So she's saying that she's very disappointed because when the gold line was current, um, the original gold line was built, it has affected businesses in East LA. Um, she says it has brought a lot of issues to the area, such as homelessness um, and the loss of uh, business and revenue. And so she's wondering, um, she says that um, this has made your presentation has made the extension sound very, very nice, uh, but she's concerned about the quality of life issues, similar to the issues that Jenny brought up at the beginning of the presentation. Thank you, Yvette, appreciate that. Um, you know, and, and we want to acknowledge that, you know, there, there were, um, you know, during the first phase of the East Side construction, there were lessons learned um, from that phase. And um, Tito has gone over several of the different programs that one assists um, businesses during construction um, and also an opportunity for uh, you know, businesses to um, work with Metro to ensure that you know, we minimize the amount of impacts. Um, while we can't minimize everything, what we try to do is, is do our best to ensure that uh, we have, we study this to really understand what those impacts are, to find ways to mitigate and work with the community on that. And Tito can maybe touch a little bit on, on those um, programs once again. Um, in regards to um, Silvia's comment about, you know, that we're coming to you with a project, keep in mind, and as we've been mentioning this throughout the entire presentation, that this is a proposed project. Uh, we're at 15% design. In order to build the project, we have to get to 100% design. There's still a lot more to do, a lot more to study uh, before the project is um, approved by the board. And then that's when it becomes a project. As of now, we again are at 15% um, uh, design. So I'm going to repeat that again so that um, folks know that they have an opportunity to still provide input on the project. We have two design options for the station at Atlantic and Pomona that will be studied and we'll look to the community to provide feedback on that. So we haven't finalized any parts of the design. It's all part of an ongoing process until we get to the board and that the board approves this project. Uh, regarding some of the property acquisitions, um, you know, Silvia has some concerns about, you know, what that looks like. That's why we have our Metro real estate team 
that can, you know, talk a bit more about the property acquisition process and that they have um, guidelines and, and laws to go to abide by um, in order to um, acquire property and also, you know, relocation. So we can have uh, Craig talk a little bit more about that if needed in, um, during Q&A um, so that he can answer questions as to how that happens. But we always try to do fair market value um, when it comes around to property acquisitions. Craig, I don't know if there's anything else to add. Essentially, um, Sylvia's comment also mentioned that property acquisitions, um, you know, that displaced property owners, how would they get another property given the fact of how high prices are now? Yeah, I don't, uh, Jenny Tito, you, you let me know how in detail we wanna get, but um, from a high level perspective, if Metro is acquiring a, let's say it's a single family residence, a home, and if the home, and I'm just gonna use real general numbers now, but if a, a home appraised for $500,000 and a replacement home could only be found for $550,000, Metro covers that difference through a relocation payment. So the acquisition would be 500, the replacement, 550 Metro would cover that difference through the relocation process. And I, I'm always a little cautious to provide numbers just because I, I those are just hypothetical. Everybody's home and relocation, it's it's totally individual. Um, and it's it's important to make certain when we get to the point where we're involved in acquisition and relocation, we're communicating openly. Thank you, Craig. I, I uh, did want to clarify something again when, uh, with the interpretation of, of Silvia's uh, questions or comment. Uh, she did make it also known that she did not want any residential impacts as far as uh, uh, right away takes. So just wanted to add that additionally yeah. to her statement. And yeah, exactly. And so the project itself, and as Melissa outlined in the project design and indicated and showed, the properties, almost all the right of way needs for the project, for the proposed project, are along Atlantic. So there are no proposed property takes for any residential properties. So no homes will be uh, considered or even, you know, looked at for any kind of property acquisition. So to clarify, when that line is curving from Atlantic down, um, through where it looks like it's going through residential, that's uh, underground? That is fully underground. And Craig could maybe talk about what it means for the properties that are above that uh, drilling area, because we are not acquiring those properties where it goes across the residential area. Essentially, it's the big drill that we showed a picture at the beginning that's gonna be drilling very, very deep um, through that area where um, folks around that area wouldn't feel that there's a machine drilling because it drills very slowly. But Craig, maybe you could speak a little bit about um, what that means for the property owners over that um, easement there. Yeah, um, and, and we have lots of experience dealing with subsurface rights tunnels. So if we have a tunnel that's going under a property, and, and I don't know, Jenny, just from a high level, do we know what the approximate depth of the tunnel is? I think Melissa might be able to give us a range, but that's, again, still being evaluated. We range from like 30 to 60 feet down. Okay, 30 to 60 feet. So what ends up happening is we would get a, um, a description of those rights, and it would tell us the exact depth of the tunnel and normally what happens is if you can envision it's it's a box so we we define a box that the tunnel will run in and we appraise the value of that box the the property rights that get acquired are what's called the subsurface easement so the rights that metro will acquire is only below the surface of the property um, where the home is there's not going to be any disruption to the property itself. And then I, I just wanted to add that in 
preparation, if, you know, um, as we complete the environmental document and if the project is approved, et cetera, and we're moving into uh, preparation for construction, there is a, a lot of analysis that is done in regards to noise and vibration and um, as well as shoring, providing protections for any of the properties. So there's a series of activities that occur to protect uh, the properties at the surface as, as we prepare for a major uh, tunneling project such as this. Dolores, you may want to also introduce yourself. We didn't get an opportunity to do that. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for your time. I know it's extremely valuable. My name is Dolores Roybal Saltrelli. I'm a deputy executive officer here to support um, the project and very much um, here to, to listen and to provide um, answers along with the team. Thank you. Thank you, Dolores and, and team. Um, you know, I think uh, I want to thank Sylvia for these questions, um, for the question that she made and the comments. Uh, it was quite a, uh, a lot of involvement from the team to, to provide as much information as possible. And hopefully uh, it satisfies a lot of the questions. And again, uh, we do not want to paint this as a pretty picture as far as what's coming. We, you know, we understand that in construction, uh, you know, there are some sacrifices that we all make. And then there's also um, challenges that we work with communities. That's why you will get a team at your location um, to help with these um, impacts as uh, construction moves forward. Again, we're not there yet. We have years before we start that. Uh, I did want to say that we are still in the environmental aspect. And moving forward, uh, we will continue you to uh, to keep you informed and, and additionally moving forward we have a lot of hands that are up so I do want to get to the next person that has their hand raised in line uh, and I, again I see them in order so I'm going to go in the order that they are showing up here and your initials are RH if you could please uh, unmute yourself you are uh, you're allowed to mute yourself right now uh, go ahead and ask your questions Are you able to hear me? Yes. Thank you. I'm at the law firm of the Southeast corner of Beverly and Atlantic. I'm eager to know why I did not get notice of last week's meeting of business owners and property owners. Second question is, how is this supposed to affect my property? Again, Southeast corner, Beverly and Atlantic. Last of the three questions I have is, are there any entry or exit portholes that are planned for that Southeast corner? That's all I have, three questions, if they might be answered. Yes, thank you. Again, uh, we, we did have a, we have, we have a team that goes and uh, delivers notices to the, uh, to the properties. Again, we don't always, uh, we're not always able to reach everybody. Uh, when we have um, the ability to, uh, to, to reach you, and thank you for joining us, um, we, we do ask for contact information uh, to be shared uh, at all times so we can keep you abreast, but I will let the project team share information about the location, any potential impacts, but I do encourage you to sign up and we will have a follow-up team uh, go to your properties to provide updates on, on everything and to also make sure that you do get uh, uh, notified of future meetings as well. And real uh, quick, um, just wanted to share before um, you know we possibly have Melissa share her screen so that she will show the, the station area. Uh, but just wanted to also mention that what we shared with the businesses and property owners is essentially the same information we're sharing today. What we wanted to do was to provide just a forum uh, for, for those property owners and businesses uh, to have an opportunity to ask questions just as you're doing today. I'm sure our Metro real estate team would be happy to speak with you if you are an affected property. And again, want to mention that this is a proposed project. Nothing is set in stone until the board approves this. And again, we're studying the different design options at Atlantic and Beverly. So it's going to depend on what station option um, is, you know, towards the end of the study, which one is uh, feasible and environment has the least amount of environmental and construction impacts. And so um, we'll continue to keep the community informed. And also don't forget, there's an opportunity to also comment on the draft environmental document as that's released uh, near summer, spring of this coming year. So there's still a lot of work, this is preliminary, um, but I'm gonna turn it over to Melissa very quickly to see if she could share her screen at Atlantic and Pomona and go over where the station entrances are. Um, and hopefully that can answer your question. And if you are, um, you know, an affected uh, property or business, 
again, our Metro Real Estate team is here and then they can provide you their information so you can have a, another conversation with them. So Melissa. Yeah, I, um, so as soon as they stop sharing, I can go ahead and. Additionally, the information that was shared last week is on the project webpage. Um, you can go to metro.net slash eastside phase two. Uh, we will show that information additionally at the end of the meeting. Uh, go to uh, the document section and uh, uh, there's a folder called previous meetings and you will, uh, there will be a folder with the uh, content that was shared uh, uh, last week at the meeting that has it already. So you can gather that information as well. And you'll see the similarities between what was presented tonight and what was presented last week. Okay. And um, I'll show both um, options. So Jenny's right, that's right in the area of, of the different um, station configurations. So Southeast Quadrant, Beverly and Atlantic, correct? Um, that would be uh, this area here. So um, the closed underground station um, would be the uh, staged on the properties to the east. Um, and then the open, station concept would um, be in these properties um, on the east side of Atlantic. You can just show the station portal entrance for the yes. covered, yeah. So we'll have one station entrance there where Melissa is pointing to on the slide. And so again, these are potentially affected um, properties, but again, we're still studying both options to see which of these would would be um, feasible. Thank you, Melissa. So we'll go back to the slide and go on to the next question. Yes, thank you, Jenny. So the next person with their hand raised, uh, their name says Ubaldo J. Um, you will be permitted to, to unmute yourself in one second. Uh, yes, can you please unmute yourself so you can ask your questions. You have a minute 30 to ask your questions and we'll answer. We are at a, able to hear you, so if you could just look for the microphone icon on your Zoom and go ahead and click that to unmute yourself. Uh, yes, again, we are, uh, your name is Ubaldo J on the Zoom and your hand is raised. Again, if you can unmute yourself, you're next to speak. Okay, it looks, we, I don't see you un unmuting yourself. So what we'll do is we're gonna go to the next person then come back to you. So the next person that is uh, in line is Arturo Gonzalez. Uh, if you can uh, unmute yourself, Arturo, you can ask your questions. I see you're unmuted, so you go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm Arturo Gonzalez, I'm an environmental planner and commerce resident. First of all, I wanna thank you guys uh, for this and look forward to this project. Uh, my question is regarding the alignment. Uh, first of all, I noticed in the map uh, that there is a BNSF uh, rail right-of-way that runs east to west in the center of the map. <clears throat> and I was wondering if there has been an environmental study to use it as the alignment. Uh, it looks as if about 40% of the tunnel would be going under the Citadel and warehouse districts. And I'm wondering in terms of, I know that there's uh, funding shortfalls if the alignment can be actually put onto the rail right of way, it uh, would reduce costs tremendously as well as provide better connections to the community and, and population centers running east to west around, along that right of way. And you could also include a, a citadel station. So those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Arturo. Uh, appreciate the support for the project. and. Um, yeah, looking forward uh, to also doing a presentation uh, tomorrow, which will start to show a bit more about the design in the City of Commerce in Montebello. Um, essentially, as we talked about um, in the alternative analysis, we looked at you know, all, every possible opportunity to connect from the existing station terminus down to Washington. And then we also reevaluated it again you know, in 2017. And at that point in time, the most feasible connection would be to go underground through Atlantic. And what that does is that it does avoid 
the mix master there in the city of commerce. And then also we avoid um, some of the freight tracks essentially leading us to the main and storage facility site, hopefully in the city of commerce. And so um, with that, you know, while we do like to coordinate with BNSF, um, the way that the project's laid out is, um, you know, the route that we found um, to be feasible to get to the city of Whittier. Um, nonetheless, you know, we appreciate the comment um, and we look forward to hearing some more of your input as it relates to, um, you know, the project and going through uh, the various jurisdictions here. Thank you, Jenny. Um, so uh, we're going to try one more time with uh, Ubaldo J. If you uh, wanted to ask your question, please do so. Otherwise, uh, we will lower your hand and then you can come back again, I, ask your question. Yes. You know, I, I think that might be our, our Metro's communications office, sir, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, I, that 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 does uh, that does seem very familiar. So um, let me read the next uh, people that we will be calling up. Um, I, I've just been going uh, name by name, but uh, the next people that we have are Eddie Torres, Carolina the Pines, and then we have Sam, and those three orders. So the next person that we are going to go to is Eddie Torres. Eddie, if you can, uh, let's wait till you're uh, you're enabled to uh, to unmute yourself, and you can go ahead and ask your questions, Eddie. Uh, okay. Hello, my name is Eddie Torres, our East LA resident and also part, <clears throat> a member of the East Los Angeles Coalition. I hope you can see this graph in uh, when when Metro came to the East LA community in 2016, 2017, we supported going underground and the conditions on Atlantic Boulevard were not severe at all. And some of the park and some of the parking issues weren't as bad, even though they were already bad. So what has happened between then and now is we had uh, uh, an abusive parking According to the document, Mallee County um, parking study paid by the CEO's office. <clears throat> and what we had is we had two catering trucks along the alignment. Now we have 12 to 16 parking all day. We had uh, we had two, we had a total of six schools of, of five schools. Now we have six. A brand new charter school is being built with no parking, no community outreach. We have new builds on, on the southeast corner of Atlantic Boulevard and Beverly. We have a drive-through car, a mobile car wash and Kitty Corner from that on the opposite corner, we have a drive-through Starbucks. We have 12 to 19 street vendors that we never had before cooking in the streets that are prohibited, sidewalk, restaurant pop-ups. And we have unlicensed street vendors seven to 10 when you only had three. The East LA Coalition standing together with residents and businesses that are impacted are asking for Metro to mitigate these, these uh, conditions of parking According to the parking study, East LA has been the worst, or we will oppose this project. Residents and business owners, please unite to stop Metro from abusing their authority. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, appreciate your comments. Uh, again, uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, again, you are joining us hey, from Kentucky? the- <laughs> No, no, no. You're, you're... No, yeah, thank you. I heard you. Um, so thank you for joining us from Atlantic Park uh, with uh, at our in-person um, uh, meeting that we're also having where we're pretty much broadcasting the zoom uh, call to uh, to folks that are at the Atlantic Park and again thank you for 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 joining us from there and uh, and uh, being a part of uh, our our discussions Eddie so the next person that we have uh, looks like it's uh, also uh, at uh, Atlantic Park is uh, says Carolina's appliances um, I think you're uh, you could ask your question um, and uh, let's see if you can uh, uh, mute yourself. And for those that are via phone, don't forget to hit yeah, pound six. Don't forget to hit pound six if you're on the phone. Yes, one more Did time. You you Did you must see? Okay. Okay. Carolina? Sí. Okay. Buenas noches uh, a todos. Va a ser su pregunta en español. Sí. Sí, okay. es en español. Okay. Déjame le pregunta a las personas que están escuchando. Can we pause the timer, please? and reset it. Um, if you are listening in English and you would like to hear the translation, uh, please hit this uh, interpretation tool at the bottom of the screen and select English and uh, the, the question will be translated for you into English. Okay, Carolina, 
digo, sí. uh, no, no, nada. La, Carolina es appliance, se me olvidó su nombre, pero sí, gracias Correcto. por venir. Sí, gracias, gracias por la invitación. Ok, pues estoy aquí este, soportando la coalición de East Los Angeles y en realidad, este, eh, no quiero sonar repetitiva, pero eh, lo que se habló en la otra, en el otro mirín, lo voy a repetir ahora, es que tenemos un grande problema con el parking aquí en el este de Los Ángeles. Yo soy dueña del negocio. Eh, mi negocio está enfrente del Banco de América sobre el Atlántico al sur de la Woody Boulevard. Y por lo que se está hablando aquí, pues bueno, este proyecto sí va a impactar bastante todos los negocios de esta área, incluyendo el mío. Entonces estoy grandemente preocupada por cómo este, se va a solucionar este problema que tenemos hoy en día con el, el problema del parking en el área. Eh, tantísimos um, eh, camionetas de comida eh, estacionadas todo el día en Woody Boulevard y en Atlantic Boulevard tomando los espacios que nuestros clientes podrían tomar cuando vienen a nuestros negocios. Entonces, um, quisiéramos uh, una vez más preguntar qué van a hacer uh, como solución inmediata a este problema antes de que se siga hablando sobre este proyecto de metro. Ahora, entonces, um, ya mirando un poco más adelante sobre, sobre este proyecto, a mí me preocupa muchísimo eh, cómo va a impactar ese proyecto mi local, mi, mi negocio, uh, puesto que de acuerdo a la foto que estoy mirando que presentaron de en la foto donde dice construcción, relación y mitigación programa. Estoy mirando fotos de cómo luciría la calle ya una vez que comiencen oh. el, el proyecto y en realidad me preocupa bastante puesto que si por ahorita no hay lugar donde mis clientes puedan estacionar. Ya una vez comenzado el proyecto, pues en realidad. Mmm, bueno, no Verónica, sé. se llama Verónica, ¿verdad? Sí, sí, me llamo Verónica. Sí, hola, hola, Verónica, es Jenny. Hola, ¿qué tal? Uh, y bueno, ya, ya tenemos sus comentarios de la, de la semana pasada, pero de veras a, a, le agradecemos que está otra vez nuevamente aquí. Y aquí en el frío. Estamos ah, aquí en el frío. Bueno, bueno, gracias. Pero um, ya, yeah, sí, sí la escuchamos y you know, tenemos por ahorita la misma respuesta y, y es de que, bueno, um, Metro no tiene pues um, el poder como el condado tiene el poder uh, para solucionar todo. So, tenemos que trabajar juntos para poder solucionar el, los problemas de parking que hemos pues, platicado. Y como le dije la, la, la semana pasada, es de que vamos a, a continuar a, a informar a la comunidad, a los negocios uh, durante este, este tiempo. Y ahorita estamos empezando. Todavía tenemos mucho diseño, construcción. Tal vez no va a comenzar hasta el 2029. Eh, el, eh, nuestra uh, directiva todavía tiene que aprobar. El, el, el proyecto. So, falta mucho tiempo para poder comenzar a trabajar con todas las agencias. Uh, pero por ahorita Metro no tiene mucha, um, ¿cómo se dice? Jurisdiction, no tiene mucho el, el, el poder de, de poder um, poner reglas, por ejemplo, en las calles. Eso es ya otra agencia. So, vamos a tratar lo, 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 lo que podemos para poder ayudar a los negocios. Y, y en verdad, esos, esas fotos que están en, en eh, que está viendo, uh, son solamente ejemplos, uh, pero en verdad mucha de la construcción tratamos de, de uh, contenerlo y que no les afecte a los negocios mucho. Thank you, Jenny. Um, again, we, we are translating this in, uh, into Spanish uh, via our interpretation feature. Uh, at the bottom, and for those of you that uh, just heard what Jenny was saying, it should have been translated into English. Um, uh, if you are listening in the English channel. Um, but Jenny, would you mind giving a brief summary in English? Just yeah, in case? definitely. So um, Veronica uh, was one of the attendees from last week's meeting. So I just wanted to reiterate that we heard her comments loud and clear um, that really a lot of the challenges that exist today in East LA are, um, you, know, um, you know, quality of life challenges that we are working with the various agencies such as uh, um, LA County, Public Works Planning, um, also Supervisor Solis's office uh, to find ways to see if we can find solutions to really 
um, help the existing businesses and community in general. Uh, but one thing to note is that um, the right of way is not in Metro's jurisdiction, right? So we have to work closely with those that do uh, have purview over um, uh, the public right of way. Thank you, Jenny. Um, so we're going to take a, another question here from our, uh, again, on site at the Atlantic Park where we are broadcasting this uh, Zoom meeting. So uh, want, I, I, we also do have some questions that have come in through the chat that I will ask, but uh, it'll be after we go to Sam. And then from Sam, I'll go and ask a couple questions that we have in the chat. So uh, Sam, please uh, unmute yourself so you can ask your question. You are next to ask your question here. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'm here to support the East LA inclusion and the questing mitigation before construction starts. I do want a car delay. I do want a car dealership on uh, Atlantic Boulevard 1019, which is exactly located uh, between uh, Verona and Olympic. And uh, I'm sure you guys heard about the last couple of years just because of. Uh, is a illegal uh, sidewalk, the uh, sidewalk, uh, catering machine, catering truck. So I've been, I've been suffering so bad, looting, you know, you name it. So I do the, here, you guys are uh, basically trying to help uh, residential, but uh, you know, I do own uh, my car dealership, which uh, I had a business. I, I've had a business over 30 years and last couple of years, uh, this business is going lower and lower and lower. So now this thing walks in, I don't know how bad it's gonna get. So I'm, uh, I'm really not into support Metro if they cannot mitigate before construction. So hopefully you guys can, you guys can come up with some, some sort of plan to help us because you know, because this thing is, it's just getting worse and worse. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Sam. Uh, they've been noted. And again, we, uh, we appreciate you, you joining us uh, from from the in-person uh, location again thanks for thanks for being here and um we do have some questions that came in through the chat feature so i want to take this time to ask these questions right now and um there are a couple here that that uh, came from uh carla solis um who asked let me see if i can get this get this document here um pretty much is asking um Please let us know how many participants are at tonight's meeting. Um, online, the, the numbers have been fluctuating. Again, we uh, we have, not everybody joins from beginning to end. The numbers uh, are up and down depending on, on, you know, when people join. Again, we have right now uh, online attendees, we have 77 who have joined us. The number was higher earlier. Um, so again, we, some people may have uh, left after their questions were asked, or they may be still here, or again, there's a, there's always change. Um, we also have some folks at Atlantic Park for the in-person meeting. I don't not have a number as to how many are at Atlantic Park, but, uh, you've heard about the last, uh, I think five people that speak are at Atlantic Park. So, um, we do have some people there. I'm waiting for my team to, to, to share how many folks are are joining us at the in-person event at Atlantic Park. Uh, the, the next question that you asked was uh, to please name the uh, the CBOs that uh, that we are working with. I think uh, the eight CBOs. So the names are Mundo Maya, uh, Disabilities Rights California, Public Matters, LA Bicycle, LA County Bicycle Coalition, Alma Family Services, Self Help Graphics, uh, Winter, which is Women in Non Traditional Employment Roles and also uh, strength-based community change. Uh, thank you for, for your questions. Again, we will come back and ask more questions that, that are um, from, the, uh, from the chat, but we do have quite a few people that have their hands raised. So we're gonna go back to uh, next person up is Francisco, uh, who is at the uh, Atlantic Park. If you can please unmute yourself, you're next up to ask your questions, Francisco. Could staff uh, please help uh, Francisco in, at the uh, on-site location to ask his question? He's uh, he's been he needs to unmute yeah, himself. Hello. hello. Yes, I hear you now. Okay. The, the question that I have is uh, 
how come when Metro plans to build a project like this, they don't ask uh, the community where the line is going to go through to see if they agree with it or not? Because uh, the, uh, most of the people that I have heard asking questions is that they know that it's just nothing but problems, uh, especially with the traffic and uh, businesses. Why don't they get the communities, community's input to see if they agree with the pilot or not? I'm sure that most of the community will say, no, we don't want this project to go through. And the reason, uh, because on Thursday right now, uh, before, when you guys build that uh, gold line on, uh, that goes on through Third Street, that three uh, had a three lanes on both directions. Oh, I mean, on uh, each direction. Now it, it has been reduced to one lane for the traffic. It's nothing but a headache for the driver for the traffic. It's terrible. So I, I'm, a, I'm afraid that this, I'm sure that this is going to happen the same thing over here, especially when it goes to, on, on Mono, through Monovelo on Washington Boulevard, where the line is going to go at great. So uh, what, what is the purpose? What, what does Metro is trying to achieve by building this project? What is the purpose of this project? So thank you, Francisco, for your comment. And I appreciate it. And I'm glad that you asked the question in terms of what is the purpose of the project? And really, it's for us to be able to provide mobility options to the community that hasn't had uh, high quality transit go through the community. And in reality, there's a lot of folks that are transit dependent, more specifically around the East LA area. So we want to make sure that we're providing that transit connection. So once uh, we build the project, the community will have access to the entire regional network and will be able to get around by train and not necessarily by car. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the project history. Um, you know, this project, again, has been studied quite a bit. Um, and, you know, it's been studied with community input and um, community support. Um, in addition to that, as, as we talked about the project overview, um, you know, the, the project looked very different uh, back in 2014. Um, and we listened to the community um, as we uh, looked at ways to connect from Atlantic Pomona down to Washington. And basically the community was support, supportive of Atlantic Underground. And so we heard that loud and clear and that's currently what we are uh, environmentally clearing and trying to understand again, what those impacts are. Um, we've had a lot of lessons learned from all the various projects. And so the goal is to ensure that we minimize the amount of impacts in terms of um, you know, property needed uh, for the project. In addition to that, we're looking at ways to minimize the amount of construction impacts. Uh, one of the things as we look at the open concept station, as you can see, the majority of the project is built on the property and not on Atlantic Boulevard that will minimize possibly you know, lessen road closures around that area. Um, so we're, again, studying everything, and there's still an opportunity for the community to provide input on, you know, the environmental document and station, you know, as we look at the station options. Um, so we've always had the community in mind, and that's who we want to serve. We want to serve the folks that live there and provide them a high-quality high transit um, option. Thank you, uh, Jenny. Um, right now it's 7.37. Uh, we, uh, we're past the amount of time that we were here, but we're going to continue to take questions. Um, so we're going to ask you if you can please uh, uh, make your questions or comments uh, briefly so we can uh, take everybody's uh, question who is in line to ask their questions. So with that, I'm going to go to Mike M., who is online. Mike, if you can please uh, unmute yourself. You're able to ask your questions now. Yeah, can you hear me? Uh, Yes, but please step, uh, step away from the microphone. You are very loud and uh, it sounds a little bit muffled. Okay, how about now? Oh yeah, much better. Thank much you, Mike. Much better, okay. So my, my question is, um, just like a general question, my first three questions, how much contingency amount is allocated for these type of projects, just generally speaking? And my second question, what are typically, what are the construction hours? And number three, what are what are like the street closures and like traffic closures and all that going on? And then my next comment is I'd like to invite everybody from Metro on this call, every single politician on this call, 
come out here to the Metro Link on Third Street on the Metro, the Metro train. Come out here right now. Check out how many passengers that train has every day, every night. I live right in front of that train, the train tracks. There's literally maybe six to 12 people at most riding the train at any given time. I don't understand why we got to build another, extend this train station further out. There's literally nobody on the train. There used to be three uh, passenger carts. Now it got down to two. And I honestly it should get down to one because nobody comes over here. And then also I had a, I had a question or concern uh, on the mentioning of the staging area of three acres. I would like to know more about that of where that's going to take place. And also I wish they would send this over to Montebello over off of Garfield because it looks like there's only going to be two to three stops here in East LA down Atlantic. And another, lastly, uh, we already have tons of public trans transportation in the area. We have Montebello bus line, Commerce bus line, East LA Soul bus line, Monterey Park Spirit bus line, the Metro bus, the Metro Rapid. We got the 5 freeway, we got the 710 freeway, we got the 60 freeway. I really don't understand why so much public transit. And if you do end up doing it, uh, I do like it underground, I got to say that. But if you're going to do it on Atlantic, please eliminate any other uh, buses along Atlantic because it's just way too much public transportation around here. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. So um, what we'll do again, we did share what, you know, those project elements and potential property needs. That's the presentation that Melissa provided and basically some of the um, potentially uh, uh, impacted properties that we're looking at or those properties that would be used for construction staging were highlighted in the presentation. Um, the presentation will become available online, including the one from last week. It has the same information, so you'll be able to see uh, those details. Um, you know, just for the sake of time, because we want to try to answer as many questions as we can, I'm not going to have Melissa pull that up. But again, those properties are available there. Um, in terms of construction periods and street closures, again, that's what's currently being evaluated in the environmental document. It's going to be very important that the community takes a look to understand exactly what it means in terms of the construction period that this project will be in construction. Note that a lot of the construction is phased, and this is a way that we would try to minimize the amount of impacts in the community. Um, so as the document gets released, the environmental impact report gets released in, um, in uh, June, um, hopefully June or spring, summer, that um, the community takes an opportunity to understand what are the mitigation measures or some of the construction related impacts in the area. Um, what was the next question regarding, yeah, ridership? Um, you know, again, we're still coming off the heels of the pandemic. Things aren't fully open, but I think with time, um, you know, our ridership will begin to increase as it has in the past. I think right now it's about being patient and understanding where we're at in terms of things opening up, people working from home. Uh, but with time, you know, we expect to see that ridership come back. And I think I would just want to add real quick um, that what's important to note is that we still need to go through the environmental process. What Jenny mentioned, it's extremely important um, to comment on the draft environmental document so we have an understanding um, of what you're sharing with us today. Um, and then we, we have the opportunity to respond formally in the final environmental document. And um, once we have gone through the environmental process and the board, you know, if and when they do approve a project, then we proceed into, um, you know, we have defined mitigation measures, but then as we did with other projects, we have the opportunity to work with the stakeholders to say, these are the construction activities. As Jenny mentioned, they're phased, but there's also an opportunity for the community to give input, to say, you know, we would prefer to have street closures on the weekends, or we would prefer to have construction hours be, you know, uh, constricted to this time frame, and so all of that gets uh, better defined once we're uh, we have more understanding of the project and we have the opportunity to get through the environmental process. Thank you, Dolores. Uh, we're going to go on to our next question. 
again, we are at 7.43, so we're going to go uh, a little bit longer. We'll extend it uh, an extra half, we'll extend it half hour to eight o'clock. Uh, we are time that uh, that we have broadcast for this meeting was uh, supposed to end at 7.30, but we have quite a, few fit, quite a few hands up. So let's go next. Next person is Sylvia, who is at that East, Ala uh, Atla East LA area uh, site, uh, Atlantic Park. So if you can please unmute yourself, uh, staff, you can help Sylvia unmute herself at the, at the location. Uh, you're next to ask your question. Uh, we're not getting anything. So what uh, we're going to do is we're going to come back to you. Um, so let's go to the next person who is up next. Uh, Brian Smith, you are able to unmute yourself. Please uh, do so. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. I really appreciate your guys taking the time to. Uh, Brian, please unmute yourself again. Sorry, we lost you there. One more time, Brian. Yes. Are you there? Yes, we can hear you now. Sorry about that. Okay, we, we reset the clock. You're good. All right. Thank you. Yeah. So um, this, conversa this conversation is really going to be directed at Craig, at Craig and the real estate development because a lot of the stuff that was brought up by um, the East LA Coalition and the questions that they're having regarding the pop-up tents, the catering uh, trucks that are this – is, this is happening right now. Their businesses are being shut down right now because there's no parking. There's there's uh, illegal setups happening. Nobody's being ticketed. It's going beyond the time that they're supposed to be there. They're double parking. They're pumping up pop-up tents all up and down the street. All of the mom and pop businesses are being uh, hurt. Greg said that they won't they they won't even consider offers on helping people get reestablished with their real estate until they got approval, which is not going to happen for seven years. These businesses are not going to last because no one's enforcing the law. It's good that Reyes is here from Salisa's Sil office because she couldn't be here. But this stuff needs to be addressed, and it's a conflict of interest to have her as the chair because she's already going to vote in approval of it because it's going to be a slap in her face if this thing doesn't get approved. So it's a conflict of interest to have her as the Metro chair and the Board of Supervisors. I don't know why that happened because she's going to be the one controlling the budget in the end and the vote. So we already know her vote's going to be yes. So at this point, this stuff needs to be addressed. East LA, East LA Coalition, I hear you. Brian Smith for LA Supervisor, District 1. Hi, Brian. Thank you once again for your comment. Um, and again, this probably doesn't fall within Metro Real Estate's purview, primarily because, um, you know, the street vending happens on public right away. And... Metro doesn't have any jurisdiction over public right of way. But anything what we're trying to do right now is work with Supervisor Solis's office. Um, again, you know, just to see how we can best coordinate some of these impacts and these concerns. And we've been hearing loud and clear from, you know, the East LA coalition and the businesses in terms of, you know, those challenges between um, both the street vending, the parking and the businesses. Um, so all I can say is stay tuned as we start to coordinate and um, continue to, um, you know, meet with you and uh, meet with all the businesses as well. But Craig, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that. I think really it's just more of a, of a public right of way um, uh, issue that perhaps we need to coordinate with Supervisor Solis's office. Yeah, I don't have anything to add, Jenny. Thank you. Well, thank you again. We we'll want to get as many questions here before eight o'clock. So um, let's get the next three people ready. Uh, it'll be Sofia Quinones, and then there's a 909 number with the last three digits, 271. And after that will be Christy Hernandez. So next person up to speak is Sofia Quinones. Uh, please unmute yourself. You're able to ask your questions. Can you hear me? Yes. Why is there no community advisory committee? Why isn't the Army Corps of Engineers present? Why isn't the Department of Public Works present? Why isn't the fire department present? Why aren't our elected officials present? The translator is in, inefficient and, bus, and butchered the translation of the Spanish language speakers. We are requesting an audit of MTA, LA County Metro. We want a list of all the properties that have been seized 
by LA County Metro? Why wasn't the bus riders union's alternative transportation recommendation placed before us? All properties taken under eminent domain, um, if they're not used, the, the previous owners should have first right of refusal. Um, this project places our community in eminent danger because of the San Andreas Fault, the Whittier Fault, the abandoned oil fields, the active oil fields, the, go the, the cogent gas explosions, the Maravilla dump, the Montebello dump, and the other neighborhood repositories. It is very important for the Army Corps of Engineers and the Department of Public Works to show the community the gas lines and what would happen if we had um, an explosion. I also am very upset that you have disabled the chat. I would have been able to put in some of the information that I have to share with the community regarding this eminent danger. We are opposed to a subway because of all this. This is why we opposed it when it came through East LA and we are happy and we were proud that Xavier Osloski supported our recommendation because of the threat that it places our community. If one of our gas lines explodes, we are gone because of all of the toxic issues that surround East Los Angeles. Our, the East LA Boyle, Heil, Boyle Heights Coalition opposes the subway and we support alternative rapid bus lines for long distance transportation, the replacement of bus lines that were taken away and an increase in shuttles in order to get people who are disenfranchised a way to get from one point to another. Again, thank you, Sophia, for your comment and I appreciate that. And again, we have a lot of representation here, but really uh, from, our, from our communities, but we also are here to inform the community, right? And we do have uh, the support of the various elected officials and are fully aware of you know, um, the community meetings that we're having, the information that we're sharing, and we're trying to be as transparent as we can be. Therefore, that's why we're sharing our proposed um, design of the project. All the comments in terms of you know, what are the fault lines and, and the various environmental impacts that this will have will be disclosed in the environmental document. Um, again, that's why we're studying it to see how the project um, you know, um, basically would, would operate um, and any other, including safety. We look at all the various aspects in terms of the questions that you just asked. We, um, you, could be, you would be able to find those in the environmental document. So stay tuned. And uh, again, that release date will, will be coming out soon, but we're aiming for spring, summer of 2022. Thank you, Jenny. Um, our next person up is a uh, phone, a phone. Uh, so please uh, unmute yourself using star six. If you hear me and your uh, number is starts with the 909, it ends in 271. Um, you are permitted to speak. Uh, just please hit star six to, uh, to speak from your phone and you should be able to, to ask your question. Again, phone number starts with 909 and ends in 271. Please unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, I wasn't able to attend the meeting last week. So I'd like to say what I was uh, planning to say last week. My name is Gloria Sanchez and I'm the co-owner of a business located on Atlantic Boulevard. I'm supporting the East LA Coalition in the request for productive dialogue regarding the prohibited pop-up sidewalk vendors, as well as the issue of food trucks that are currently being, being allowed to park all day in a clearly marked two hour zone. I know you spoke earlier and said that this is not quite an issue that uh, is being addressed by Metro, but I feel that we could get your support. I'd like to share that our business has experienced problems with both types of vendors, with the food trucks causing an especially bigger problem. Their disregard for the property of others is more than frustrating. It, on many occasions, has been unlawful. Parking their cars and their trucks while blocking the entrance to our business driveway and exceeding the allowed parking time are just two examples of the regular problems that have impacted our business. Ignoring these problems, as well as those of our business neighbors, will only allow the situation to escalate. If these issues are not addressed by the proper agencies the future environment of East LA will be negatively impacted with a higher level of unnecessary congestion and unhealthy streets. 
based on our prior interactions with your agency representatives, we found them to be attentive and opening to listening to our concerns. Therefore, we're asking you once again to listen to our valid concerns and assist us in cleaning up our streets so that we can go forward as a united front for a better and improved environment for the residents and business owners of East LA. Thank you. Thank you again uh, for, for sharing your thoughts. Um, this information is available on the project webpage. You can also uh, provide additional comments uh, through via email. But again, um, we are asking folks to please limit their comments to a minute 30 so we can get to as many folks as possible. Um, once, once again, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to go to the next, uh, the next person who is uh, in line, which is Christy Hernandez, followed by Carlos Benavides. So Christy, if you can please unmute yourself, you're next to speak. Good evening and thank you for this presentation. My name is again, Christy Hernandez. I'm a third generation homeowner and chairperson of the East Los Angeles Maravilla Community Advisory Committee. For a number of the attendees on this call, I know that this is not our first rodeo uh, with Metro. We lived through the construction of the goal line when it first came through our community. And I echo Silva Corona and Francisco's comments. We learned the hard way um, regarding Third Street. It ruined a very large open road. Um, and we now have one line bottleneck um, and challenges for re first responders to get through. No adequate parking for locals to park and ride the Metro. I have to travel further east in order to go west um, for the parking structure on Atlantic. The businesses along that corridor were negatively impacted. And I bring this up because as Sylvia mentioned in concept, this is great for public transportation. And while we do support public transportation options, we wanna make sure that it's not at the detriment of the communities it passes like unincorporated East Los Angeles. I cannot emphasize enough that this is a colossal project that will negatively impact us as residents, homeowners, and business owners. So with regard to traffic and the economic impact that it will have, I, I believe that that will be the case. And therefore, my question request is that um, I'm asking, uh, we are asking for targeted outreach, a community advisory, and a metro community liaison that will help facilitate our concerns and help find solutions, resolutions to mitigate the much larger and detrimental impacts to uncorporated East Los Angeles. And if there is enough money to build this extension, now we ask that Metro do its due diligence with community outreach and provide funds that will be allocated for extensive community outreach. And in the past, we're not talking about one block radius or flyers at local libraries. Make sure to talk to all folks that will be impacted. And based on the project plans, I believe that we need to have a more descriptive and visible um, idea of what the construction will entail, given that we're not experts in this area. And then one last thing regarding the Third Street Woods uh, revamp. Um, does the EIR capture how the construction will negatively impact the East LA Sheriff Station? Will this lead to any call disruptions and response times? This was already a plan uh, that was a mistake in the Third Street um, Third Street plan because the sheriffs cannot exit on that street if they need to go um, east on Beverly. So as you heard, we have a number of underlying issues that must be addressed before moving forward with this construction that are already impacting our quality of life. So I look forward to additional meetings in order to keep the community informed and more importantly, engaged. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Uh, I think Jenny, um, she is, I don't know if this is a question for Jaime about the environmental uh, process, but we do coordinate uh, with emergency responders and also uh, we, I know there's, a, there's, there's chapters in the environmental document that discusses uh, construction um, mitigations and all that other stuff. So I don't, uh, Jaime, are you on? If you can address this briefly. Yeah, what you said is exactly what is going to be in the document. It's it's it evaluates all different uh, impacts and it evaluates impacts to um, emergency services and it uh, looks uh, provides mitigation requires besides anything that's legally required to um, have um, coordination with the police or or fire departments to review plans and things like that. Um, it can add some additional mitigation to make sure that happens. Thank you, Jaime. And additionally, another comment that um, you did ask for a community liaison uh, when construction happens. And again, we uh, it's not just one community liaison, it's a team of community liaisons that will be a part of the project once construction uh, approaches. Uh, not when it begins, but as construction is starting to ramp up and getting ready, you will have a, a team of community relations uh, folks uh, 
um, dedicated specifically to this project that will be uh, working with everybody in the community um, as we uh, move forward with this project. Uh, again, we have uh, a couple minutes, so hopefully we can get to these next couple of questions. The next person up is uh, Carlos Benavides. Carlos, if you can unmute yourself, you can ask your questions here. Hey, um, I want to thank you for the presentation, first off. Um, I know there's going to be quite a bit of an unanswered questions, and I know you're barely at the beginning, which I see that, so I'm not going to give you a lot of complaints, but one of my concerns that was brought up by somebody, if it's underground, what are you going to have in place to help somebody that's in a wheelchair get out if something happens? Because as of right now, I don't see very many things that are being done. Okay, that's number one. Um, I'd like you to build my confidence more than what I see. And one of the people that was speaking right now says, you know, we're trying to be transparent. That's not what we're looking for. We actually are looking for transparency. Okay, and being disabled and in the disabled community, I really haven't heard much about how you're gonna handle any of this. You're gonna have an elevator. What if the elevator goes out? What are you gonna have in place to get myself or any other constituent out? And I would like to find out more about your community boards, your, activ your activities, and how you're promoting all this information because apparently a lot of people aren't aware of it. I wasn't aware of a lot of this. And I sit on the commission. So, you know, if you could take care of that, I would appreciate it. And one thing to one of your commentators is questions may have been repeated, okay? But as constituents, they do have the floor and should be heard. Thank you. Pick. Yes. Go ahead, Tito. Oh no, thank. I was uh, thanking uh, thanking Carlos for his uh, first questions, and uh, there were quite a few questions that we could uh, address. Um, yeah, absolutely. And so, in terms of transparency, that is exactly what we're doing. You know, we're providing right now the proposed project design. Uh, we just provided the preliminary cost estimates, <laughs> and as we start to study the project again, all that information is going to be publicly available for everyone to review. As it pertains to um, access and disability access and safety in general for the entire community, that is at the forefront um, in terms of what we look at um, as we start to um, you know, design the project and understand what those impacts are. So a lot of what is being asked today will be addressed through the draft environmental document. Um, you know, I hate to sound like a broken record, but um, you know, that's where we outline specifically what, um, what, what will be the process for construction, what kind of uh, safety measures are in place, um, things of that sort will be included. So, um, you know, stay tuned because we're going to continue to have more dialogue. We're going to continue have a, uh, to have another round of community meetings because as we have information to share, we, we're definitely coming to the community uh, to provide those updates as we do with our board. Um, so that's currently all I have in terms of, uh, of an answer for, for Carlos, but I, again, you know, stay tuned and a lot of the community outreach, uh, team will be out, you know, uh, making sure that we, uh, extend that outreach. And that's why we're working with our local community, um, organizations as part of that as well. Thank you, Jenny. And and yes, we again we we are asking folks if again to, to please help spread the word. We are uh, working with the community-based organizations, uh, all the elected area officials in the area, representatives, everybody to help spread the word. And we can always use more help, uh, more uh, collaborations. So again, please uh, reach out to us so we can um, uh, be able to coordinate better with you on how to, to, to gain knowledge of this project as, as we uh, continue to have these meetings. And as you can see on the screen, um, I did want to share the meetings that we have coming up. Uh, we had the meeting tonight uh, uh, focused on East LA. And uh, thank you to those of you uh, who joined us. Again, we appreciate you you being here and, and uh, hearing the latest on the project. Tomorrow night, we're going to be at the uh, uh, at the Commerce City Hall parking lot. Um, if you would like to join us in person, uh, it's in Commerce and we will be discussing the cities of Commerce and Montebello. Uh, meeting is uh, at six o'clock to 7.30, just like tonight. Again, uh, you can go to the uh, in-person location if you would like to, to participate in person or you can join us online via Zoom. 
Uh, and then next week, meeting number three will be on Wednesday, March 16th from 6 to 7 30 p.m. again. And in that meeting, we will be discussing the cities of Pico Rivera and Santa Fe Springs. And if you would like to uh, join us in person, it will be at the Pico Rivera Senior Center, 9200 Mines Avenue in Pico Rivera. Again, you can join us in person or online. It will also be on Zoom uh, for you to, to join us in that matter. And then our last meeting will be uh, next Thursday, March 17th, a week from tomorrow from 6 to 7.30 p.m. And it's going to be uh, discussing the city of Whittier. And we will be uh, in person at the Whittier Uptown Senior Center at uh, 13225 Walnut Street. Uh, or you can join us via Zoom like we're doing right now. So again, you have, uh, we have three more meetings starting tomorrow uh, to talk about cities of Commerce and Montebello. Then next Wednesday to talk about the cities of Pico Rivera and Santa Fe Springs. And then next Thursday, uh, the 17th, to talk about the cities of the city of Whittier. Uh, so again, thank you for joining us. Let's go to the next slide uh, to provide additional information, um, how to contact us and where to get additional information on the project. Um, you have our contact information up here. Uh, there's a dedicated project line. You can always call again if you would like to be added to a project database. Please call or email us. Uh, you can call the, de the dedicated line at 213-922-3012. That's 213-922-3012. Uh, email us eastside phase then the number two at metro.net once again east side phase two at metro.net and uh let us know that you'd like to be added to the project database you can get additional information and additionally you can go and check out uh the presentations online go to uh, the project webpage metro.net slash east side phase two and uh we hope to get this updated and added to the project webpage uh, tomorrow. So just give us about a day or two to have this processed and you will be able to uh, see a copy of these documents online as well. Again, thank you for joining us. Uh, this is um, this has uh, been great for us, uh, for you to join us again. We appreciate all the questions that we had tonight. I know there are more questions and comments that uh, we have, but we will have be, be having more meetings. Um, so uh, please stay tuned and uh, we will provide you with the next update in the next month or so. Uh, we'll be out again to the communities to provide you that. So uh, again, thank you for joining us and I wanna thank you and uh, please have a good night. Take care, everybody.